I like now to call upon Professor Hamza Abdul Rahman to take the stage and to deliver on his uh, topic. Please welcome Prof Hamza. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a good morning to everyone. Selamat hari raya to all of you. Uh, thank you very much uh, Tan Sri and also to uh, Sunway University and especially uh, JCI for the invitation today for me to share my experience uh, with IUMW. Um, I managed to speak to one of my, two of my colleagues just now uh, that thought that I've retired from IUMW and I'm, I'm, and I'm no more working, but I say I'm back at UM. <laughs> I've got another couple of months to go before my true retirement comes. Um, okay. Uh, Sakina, uh, Dr. Sakina mentioned that um, she may prefer to be in a situation where she sets a new university. And uh, uh, well, I must tell you that it may sound easy, but it is not. <laughs> I'm going to share with you what we went through, uh, challenges of developing a private university uh, with co-ownership. Not one partner, or not one person, but it's a partnership between two entities. Uh, the IUMW experience. IUMW stands for the International University of Malaya Wales. What I am going to present includes introduction, how it happened, important things uh, to remember from my own mind, uh, the business plan, issues and challenges, overcoming issues and challenges, lessons learned, and also we're going to have a summary at the end of the presentation. Okay. Here, yeah, right? And the University of Wales. Do you all know the University of Wales? All of you? Okay, good. Uh, how many universities does University of Wales uh, carry with it? The name University of Wales in Wales? Many. <laughs> um, well, the UM as well as UW created history in Malaysian higher education when they forged a partnership in 2012 to establish a private university in Malaysia. This presentation covers, among others, the extraordinary collaboration which took place in 2012 and how the joint venture deal was struck benefits of that joint venture and the challenges in creating the private university. Why did it happen? How did it happen? Will be covered in this presentation. Why do you think it happened? You see, in 2010, um, there was a piece of news in the newspaper when I checked back. Uh, in the preparation of this uh, presentation, I had to look back my emails, you know, uh, dated from 2010 to recollect some of the things, the facts. Uh, and it was really quite a journey going back. I think I spent almost one week, two or three hours a day uh, just to retrieve those information. And when I look back, there was a piece of news in the newspaper when the Minister of Higher Education then mentioned that there will be four public universities that will be given the autonomous status. Autonomous means that by the year 2020, these four universities will not be able to get 30% of their annual budget from the, the government. So how do they get the money? They have to generate their own income. Well, everybody was talking about maybe we will have courses, we will have uh, additional uh, programs, teaching, but when I sit down and think, that will not be enough uh, to cater for that 30%. So you have to do something more than that. And that's when a person by the name of Tan Sri Gauss used to be the Vice Chancellor of UM, um, thought about four mega projects. For us, it was mega. One was the Health Metropolis Project. The second was the development of Section 16 into a commercial hub. Number three, a private university. And number four, plantation, oil palm plantation. 
Well, what the hell does oil palm plantation got to do with education? No, it doesn't have to do directly with education, but it will be a money generator. It will add up to, according to his calculation then, uh, that 30% by the year 2020. But time passes and people get cleverer. Some people became disruptors in the system. So some people threw spanner into the bicycle wheel and only one of the four projects actually was implemented. And that's the private university, IUMW. How I did it, how we did it was because I think we moved faster than the other three projects. If we had waited for another six months, the IUMW would have just been something that people mentioned as something of Tansri's dream. <laughs> okay. Um, from what I've described, IUMW is to be uh, an income generator for UM. It is going to be also uh, an institution that will provide an alternative place to UM uh, for students to study. Why? Because in the year 2011, UM embarked on uh, its journey to become the best university in Malaysia and to be leading the pack of universities uh, in terms of university ranking. In order to do that, one of the strategies employed was to have the number of postgraduate students increased and the number of undergraduate students decreased. We had a student population of about 25,000 total population then. Uh, the number of uh, postgraduate students was just about 5,000. So imagine we have to increase that number in order to make it one-to-one. -one. You have to make it about 12,500 or 13,000 to 13,000. 13,000 postgraduate students and 13,000 undergraduate students. That will make it one-to-one. -one. And it will affect the ranking in terms of the points that the rankers give to universities. This has an effect on the university's ranking. So that was one of the strategies. And we thought that by having a new university, then students who have been displaced would be able to go into the private university. Towards the end of uh, 2011, 2010, University of Wales came into, a pic into the picture. It came about by, uh, I think it was by sheer coincidence, uh, the University of Wales had a meeting with uh, the Vice-Chancellor, uh, wanted to talk about having joint programs uh, with the Faculty of Engineering. Later on, this idea of having joint programs was abandoned and a brand new idea came about. Why don't we set up a joint venture, through joint venture, a new private university? And knowing this person, TSG, um, he would just take this idea up and see the minister. And he got a nod from the minister. The minister agreed uh, to this and he asked us to fly straight away to Wales, talk to Wales, uh, due, uh, did uh, a due diligence exercise and then uh, Wales was also excited. Uh, the new university was to be called University of Wales Malaya. But then uh, some people in Wales didn't agree with that name because it is in Malaysia. It should have been, the M should be, uh, should be first instead of Wales. So it became University of Malaya Wales. Uh, and in one of the discussion in TSG's room, I remembered somebody pointed out that somebody is him actually. <laughs> uh, why don't we insert the name international in front of U -W uh, UMW? And it became IUMW. Wales agreed. The University of Malaya's uh, LPU or Board of Governors also agreed to that name. Um, why UW? Some people ask me 
and even ask Tan Sri, why did you pick UW? Why not say MIT? Why not Stanford? Why not Cambridge? Right? Why not Oxford? Why not University of Manchester? Well, the reason is quite simple. Uh, we talk about sustainability. In order for a joint venture to be sustained, in order for a collaboration to be sustained, it must have the fuel to make it run. And that fuel must last a long time. If we had collaborated with a university which has uh, been branded uh, maybe top 10 in the world, uh, you have to pay higher. And the cost is not going to be just any higher, but it's going to be very high. Too high for UM to bear, even at that moment. So the idea is to find a partner um, which we feel that is able to work with us, uh, willing to invest together with us, UM, and willing to share the expertise uh, and the academic experience with us. And uh, fortunately for us, we had UW right in that spot at that time. We also uh, talked to the University of Wales at that time about having um, our students earn a second degree. We call it the dual award. A dual award means that a university student from IUMW can earn a University of Wales certificate or degree you know, by going through the uh, accreditation as well as the validation process. So there have been students uh, who have graduated in 2015 um, who has earned two degrees. IUMW's degree as well as the UW's degree. In fact, a few of them, uh, the first batch, went to Wales to pick up their degree. They attended the convocation. Okay, uh, the application of the university came about in 2011. Um, we had to do a lot of follow-ups uh, with the ministry. I think the ministry just has a lot of things to do. Uh, all the time during uh, the whole year, uh, you have to simply got to do a lot of follow-up, emails, phone calls, just to make sure that things are not being uh, left out of the track. IUMW then started with zero approval, zero institutional approval and zero program. Uh, what I mean here is that when we started IUMW, we had not obtained any approval. Uh, we just had the institutional approval approved in 2013 officially, but the application was submitted in 2011. Yeah. Um, when we moved, it was just an office. Here's the progression milestone. We applied for the establishment of the private institution of higher learning in 2011. Uh, we applied for registration of IUMW. Uh, that means we have to deal with the local authorities, uh, the DBKL, uh, the fire department, and the uh, private institution of higher learning section at JPT. Um, we had to also apply for uh, the license to recruit international students from KDN. There was an evaluation and verification visit on the 6th of March 2013. And the f finally, the approval of registration of IUMW came about on 13th March 2013. Uh, things have to run parallel. Um, at the same time, we submitted for the establishment approval. Uh, we also prepared our documents for submission to the MQA. That means the programs uh, that we submitted to MQA, uh, we submitted three programs in 2012, uh, in October. You can see here, BBA, uh, Foundation Science, and also Foundation in Arts. Yeah, here. And 
uh, November, December, April. Why I have this uh, particular figures uh, colored is that you can see here foundation in science we submitted in October the approval came in April uh, foundation in arts submitted in the same month it came about in August um, BBA it came about in BBA honors came about in uh, November there's another one here where is it here so in general it takes about to me about seven to eight months sometimes even ten months to get approval from uh, MQA and uh, when I went into this uh, private university everybody was giving me a very rosy picture uh, that everybody is going to work fast and things will go very smooth but in reality things didn't work that way so one thing that you have to learn is that you have to risk manage the risk manage the risk of uh, delayed in getting your approvals especially when you are uh, talking about offering new programs There is one here, uh, like for example, uh, we submitted the MBA program. MBA, we had our approval in uh, May of the following year. So you see, um, we cannot offer any course uh, without the approval of the MQA as well as the KPT. What happens if you do that? The CEO will be fined and what's the word? Jailed. <laughs> so I don't want to go and take uh, that risk although people, some people say that you can, you can, you can, you know. <laughs> but I'm the kind of person that I think it is better to be safe than sorry and better to be safe than cry later. You see here that we started to talk about uh, marketing uh, we started to accept in students into the uh, university in this uh, part of the year 2013. So this was when actually we started to have students uh, at IUMW. And you will see later on that we have about 100 students at that time. 100 students in 2013. When we moved to the city campus, do you know where the city campus is? Uh, it is in the same uh, compound as the Open University of Malaysia. Uh, one of the first few things that uh, we have to do uh, was to recruit staff. Uh, recruitment of staff, uh, many, many people thought that when we open up this private university that we are using uh, UM's resources. No, uh, there were only two of us or three of us being seconded from UM. Uh, it was me, my uh, vice president then, uh, Professor Bernie, and also one more uh, person from the IT section of UM. So only three were seconded to IMW. The rest we had to actually recruit from the open market. Uh, getting institutional and agencies approval uh, is not going to be easy. It has never been easy, and there is no exception to this one. Preparation of uh, documents and uh, getting the approval. Uh, programs, what kind of programs do we offer? What are the marketable programs? Um, you see, when I was in UM, um, when we offer programs, uh, very rare did we think about uh, whether this program will sell uh, in the market. Sometimes programs in UM at that time, and even now I think, uh, you can have very small number of students, which makes it to the eyes of the private universities uneconomical to run. Yeah. So uh, I had to actually learn um, my 
I wouldn't want to say this, but I have to. But uh, my advisor <laughs> at that time, uh, and also my mentor, uh, was also uh, Tan Sri. Uh, but I do not want to kacau him, you know, all the time. Because what's the point of appointing one person to lead the university and I kacau him all the time? Uh, I had to actually Google up, seek advice from uh, friends. Sometimes I will text him. And we find out that uh, one of the things that you have to do is to actually gauge from the job market. We have uh, Job Street. Uh, a lot of times you will see numbers of vacancies in the organizations. You can actually have a feel of what's the most uh, in thing at a particular time and the trend. You can actually predict in about three years, four years time, what's going to be needed by the industry. Uh, you talk about uh, having people who graduate and uh, work in the government I think that's not going to be uh, rosy anymore because the government uh, has too many staff already. They will not be able to take in uh, m many of the graduates. So many of the graduates will either have to be self-employed or be working in the industry. Learn from best practices uh, from other private universities. We actually visited a couple of uh, private universities. Uh, thank you to them. Uh, I managed to... Uh, see what uh, other private universities were doing then. Because at that time, in UM, we used to be uh, thinking that UM is the best. But when you go out, you'll see how colourful things are uh, in other private universities. So we have to make the same to IUMW. If you have the time, if you can visit IUMW, you'll see that it's all painted red. Red white, yellow, a bit of UM's color, blue, and also uh, Will's color, which is blue. And we also had to actually refurbish the university. When you visited universities at that time, you will see that the private universities were all in uh, good colors, well painted, looks nice from the outside. So IUMW at that time, the buildings at the ski campus need some refurbishment and furnishing. Uh, getting the relevant board papers and business plans. Uh, altogether, we had about 20 revised business plans, or rather, uh, revised versions of the business plans. And the business plans, we didn't call any consultant. It was just me, uh, Prof. Bernie, and we had our counterpart in Wales, and we communicated through emails uh, to get uh, the business plans updated. A lot of assumptions were being made at that time, assumptions uh, especially on marketability of the programs, uh, the number of students, uh, time when the cash flow is going to be needing so much money, when it's going to be break even. Uh, things like this were being discussed most of the time over the telephone or the internet. Uh, and we had to actually work on the dual award program. You see, one thing about the University of Wales is that they are very particular about giving uh, dual award. Even the University of Malaya, uh, which has been running uh, this program uh, for so many years, they will not want to give unless if you go through their accreditation and validation process. Yeah. So it is a lengthy process. It takes about roughly about one year to get the final approval. And once you get the approval, they will give you uh, program approval for every individual program. They will come to uh, the university that awards, uh, that, that runs the program uh, for um, uh, inspection, as well as to interview the students, the lecturers, and to have a look at the examination papers and answer scripts. Because of that, the quality of IUMW, especially the dual abroad programs, is always um, under uh, the guard of UM as well as UW. So that tells you about the quality and the contents of uh, the syllabus. Branding and marketing. Um, 
in UM, back in UM, I was given the training to run a faculty. I was given the training to run development projects. I was given the training to run academic programs as a DVC in academic, as a uh, DVC for uh, research and innovation. But never had I had the chance to be trained uh, in anything uh, which is close to branding or marketing. Never talk about branding. Never talk about marketing. Only now they start to, to talk about marketing. Why? Because the number of students uh, actually uh, is a little bit on the decline. Yeah. So, in fact, the dean of my faculty had asked me to assist the faculty uh, to brand the faculty to make sure that we have uh, more students in the year 2018. It's too late to do branding in 2017 and to expect results in 2017. It takes time. Yeah. Um, and they wanted to break away from the uh, UPU system <coughs> for two years already, but the result wasn't pleasing. Uh, the number of students that get into some of the programs actually dropped. This is UM. Anybody from UM here? Important points to remember, uh, I had to do my own uh, self-policing, having a transparent finance student management system. Uh, being a new private university, people talk about it, but people will not be uh, interested to actually put their son or daughter to risk yet until they know that that university has proven itself. So we had actually a tough time. The name of UW and U UM is not enough. Especially when, back then, I still remember there are some quarters in UM who didn't like this idea that TSG brought about. Who is this TSG wants to bring uh, uh, a new university, UM, setting up another university? I don't like this idea. And there have been incidences where... Um, Parents came to us and said that, hey, uh, there are guys in UM that says that this is a uh, new university, don't go to this university. So, another thing to remember is the parent uh, company must actually uh, not only buy over but explain to uh, their staff what's happening. If uh, you have uh, things like this happening, then <coughs> it will only disrupt the running of the university, <coughs> the new university. Uh, hiring of quality academic and support staff. This is also another challenge. Um, we all used to go to interviews uh, and interview people for recruitment. But from my personal experience, I must say that uh, interview should not be the only way. Uh, when you interview a person, imagine if there are 10 candidates, every one of them would have prepared for the interview. Every one of them will give, give you the best show during the interview. Don't you think so? And sometimes you will find it very, very difficult because... Um, you have got out of 10, three people who are the best performers, and whereas you need only one. But when you get that person, one, that one person, after one year, then you realize uh, that <coughs> probably you have taken the wrong person. And when that happens, um, it's quite typical to actually remove <coughs> uh, somebody from your organization. But in our case, uh, <coughs> there were a couple of, uh, there were a few academic staff that we had to remove from the system uh, because students actually complain. <coughs> uh, students complain and we had to actually take a drastic step. Of course, you have to go through the due process, give them warning, uh, meet them, advise them, and then finally uh, submit them uh, that letter of termination. But it's not easy. Uh, I remember uh, two cases uh, where uh, we were asked to go to the industrial court, yeah, but then 
things got resolved. But these are the kind of things that you don't hear in UM. But in order to preserve uh, the quality of the university, I believe that we must always maintain the best brains, people who are committed towards higher education and also people who are hardworking and must be friendly to our students. Instilling trust amongst potential students and parents, I think this is something which uh, uh, we, we are getting the trust uh, of potential uh, students as, as well as their parents. Prudent in spending, prepare worst scenario budget at the beginning. Uh, in the beginning, we used to prepare only one budget, but later on, uh, we learned that we have always to make ourselves prepared <coughs> for the worst case scenario. So in our budgets that came later, uh, that was like about one and a half years later, we always had to prepare for the worst case scenario budget. So we had the optimistic, <coughs> the middle of the road, as well as the worst case scenario. And I think by having the uh, worst case scenario budget, you will not uh, make the board members, uh, you will not be giving them any surprise. Recruitment of more international students. Um, how do you think we can recruit international students? <coughs> do you think it is easy to recruit international students? Especially a new private university? That was one of our biggest problems at the very beginning. So, um, I found out that one of the best ways, or in fact the best ways uh, to get to know to international students and to get uh, our university to be known by international students or prospective international students is by the use of the social media as well as the internet. We cannot afford to be going overseas all the time because it's very expensive. So make use of the f uh, social media. The social media uh, especially when we talk about later on, when we talk about the SEO, the um, uh, search engine optimization SEOs, as well as the social medias like Facebooks, etc., SEO will take time. It will take about nine months at the earliest for you to be able to see your result. So you have to plan ahead. Don't expect that you have your advertisements in the web today and next month you're going to have droves of international students coming to your door. No. Nine months is for them to know you because there are thousands of other universities in the world making use of this uh, technology. Yeah, And uh, Facebook, the time uh, that you take to respond uh, to your uh, prospective students is also something which is very important. You cannot afford to wait. I used um, to have Zopim. Uh, Zopim, uh, anybody heard about Zopim? I think some of you have, right? Zopim. Zopim is actually a chat facility. So we put into our system the chat facility. People who clicks onto that page uh, will see a square box at the bottom right hand corner. Uh, then will wish that person good afternoon, good morning, or will explain to him about this university in one line and say if they have and ask if they have any question. Uh, they start asking questions. If the uh, person in, in, in the university is around, then they can actually start to chat with one another. If not, then it will be stored in the system and in the next day, uh, somebody will respond uh, to that uh, inquiry. I think... Uh, we managed to uh, attract quite a few number of students uh, using this chat facility. And do you know what time is the most um, frequent time that you get visitors? <laughs> it's after 10. <laughs> after 10 at night. Sometimes, uh, because we're talking about local as well as international. So uh, they actually ask you a lot of questions. And you will see that uh, there will be some who like to ask questions but never come. You know, <laughs> They only ask questions. I guess they must be doing this elsewhere too. 
but there are some serious ones who actually came and registered uh, to the university. Monitor monitoring and control of the cash flow is something which is very important. Uh, IMW started with uh, capital of 20 million ringgit. Uh, 20 million ringgit. We have been asked to pay uh, rental um, to that building that we used and we have been asked to pay electricity. Uh, we have been asked to pay uh, water bills uh, as well as security bills. We had our own security. So uh, some people thought that when UM set up this private university, everything is free for that new university. No, we had to pay for everything. We had to pay as if we are a private university operating in KL. Uh, we have to pay a rental which is about uh, almost close to 250 uh, per square foot and we had to pay about in total 250,000 a month in terms of rental so on one hand I have to worry about the students on one hand I've got to uh, worry about the institutional approval uh, MQA and then on the other hand I've got to think about giving back to UM what they've given to us so it was quite stressful <laughs> So, uh, I do not know whether you like to start any university now. <laughs> <laughs> so, branding and marketing is something which is uh, important. They are important. One of the things that I thought uh, had an impact on uh, IUMW was when we put up this uh, big signage uh, at Wisma R&D. Uh, that Wisma R&D is where Tan Sri sits most of the day every day of the week. Uh, I don't want to tell you which level, that one you can ask him. Um, but on both sides of uh, Wisma R&D, we had this logo. You know, to have this logo, to get the approval from DBKL, it takes three months to four months. It's not easy like you want to have this logo, you put it up uh, once it's ready. No, you have to get the approval. Everything takes time. So you have to actually plan, plan ahead. So before intake in July or in September, you have to plan six months, six months before to have things ready. This is the first brochure that we had. You can see that person there uh, with almost very few books on, uh, no books in some of the cabinets. And then uh, that person's hair was dark at that time. <laughs> what has become to the hair of that person now, you can see also. Um, we had uh, pictures of, uh, this is to show uh, whales, whales also, um, talk about UM, whales, and uh, something about the courses that we offered. So important things to remember, continued. <coughs> Making IMW visible, that's the word, making it visible. Even until now, if you go to some parts of Malaysia, uh, people would not recognize if we were to mention IMW. So it takes time, it takes time. But I'm very happy that uh, uh, nowadays when you go to town, uh, especially in and around uh, KL, uh, people already know about IMW. Timing of, appro of approval as well as offering of programs is also very crucial. So you have to actually make sure that uh, your timing when of approval before you offer your programs. Uh, you have to be working very far ahead whenever you want to uh, introduce a particular program. Uh, this I'm talking about MQA. Uh, make sure that there is enough fund uh, to pay the staff salary. Okay, I thought, I thought at the very beginning 20, 20 million is a lot of money, but 20 million is not a lot of money. <laughs> Once you start to pay uh, salary, you start to pay the rental, uh, you start to pay the bills, you start to pay MQA and etc. 
uh, then uh, 20 million finishes very fast <laughs> so my responsibility was to make sure that <coughs> uh, our staff get paid all the time every I mean every month so I have to actually keep a very close watch of the cash flow cash inflow cash outflow I also realized that the cost of education must be reasonable <coughs> we tried to have the cost of education of the pro of our programs a little bit high in the very beginning but then uh, looking at the response we started to give discounts <laughs> I guess this is also happening elsewhere um, you have to be sensitive uh, especially now uh, due to the government's uh, slash in PTPTN the public universities uh, maximum allowable PTPTN loan has been slashed uh, by 10 percent private universities have been uh, slashed by 15 percent you have to be uh, wary of this so and plus the fact that our economic situation now is uh, probably uh, on the downside parents are scratching their head uh, whenever it comes to university education so the price must be fair and reasonable nothing comes easy hard work this goes without saying but uh, from my own personal experience uh, every day I have to actually look into the internet and especially the responses to our Zopim to make sure that there are people who come to the website make inquiries and their inquiries have been answered because these are prospect every week you will have to worry about the numbers you know I can't describe to you that kind of feeling it was not exciting at that time of meaning uh, at, the, at the time of uh, uh, the time that you set up a new university uh, there will be times that you will feel so um, frightened that the numbers are not met you are afraid that you will not be able to uh, show to the board members uh, the numbers that you have projected two or three months ago uh, the kind of feeling is it's me but when you think about it uh, you will have to uh, praise God uh, times have passed the numbers have grown when I left the university uh, the number was at 1300 yeah alhamdulillah take care of the stakeholders <coughs> very important as uh, Dr. Sakina mentioned just now you have to take care of your stakeholders in that course there will be uh, some members in the stake some people some members of the board etc who will be very very difficult to please uh, they I've read uh, a Harvard Business Review article which described this kind of people as disruptors yeah. Uh, board meeting disruptors uh, it was actually documented in Harvard Business Review so then when I read that article I said oh I'm not the only one <laughs> this kind of thing is happening elsewhere too that's why uh, it's been documented in Harvard Business Review so take care of your stakeholders um, it's very important in fact um, in the latest project management uh, book PMBOK a book of knowledge the project management Institute has recognized that stakeholder management is one very important issue in project management keep refining the business model okay after we had the initial business model which was um, constructed uh, in Excel file uh, I began to read more on business model and I use the canvas method and I'm now sharing with you uh, what our business model is okay we have key features uh, key partners uh, University of Malaya as well as the University of Wales 
we have our key marketing uh, we have our key activities marketing and customer relation management teaching and collection collection means collection of fees uh, we have key resources being the physical campus itself academic staff professional and support staff mqa approved academic programs our key propositions these are things that we sell uh, to uh, people uh, to our prospects one is quality and affordable higher education we have to make sure that although we have a dual award still there will be takers number two academic experience from um as well as university of wales combined uh, why we say this is because uh, some of our students can actually spend time in um as well as in wales they can spend one semester in um and they can spend one semester in Wales and four semesters at IUMW. Opportunities to study a semester in Wales and also or if they do not want to spend one semester in Wales, they can join in the mobility program where students will go to Wales for their summer break, maybe about two to three weeks and have uh, 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 discussions with their colleagues uh, from the student bodies there. Uh, it is uh, located strategically in Kuala Lumpur, the campus. Uh, it has got excellent library facilities uh, because Wales have allowed our students to access their library. We have to pay UM, but our students are also allowed to use UM's database. Online learning facility, we use, uh, most of the time, we use uh, Moodle, uh, cultural diversity, the first year we ran, we had about 15% uh, of the students coming to IUM, IUMW uh, from foreign countries, which is not bad, I thought. So if we can maintain and increase the number, then it will be good. So the use of social media, the use of SEO, the use of Zopim, all helped. Uh, International Research Informed University. Uh, customer relations, these are the things that you have to take care. Uh, especially your front, front counter service. This is something which, which, which is very difficult for me to um, impress on the staff that you must have quality when you meet people. You must impress on the people when you meet them the first time. It is not difficult, you know, uh, but staff are making it as something which is very difficult to do because they're not used to, because maybe because uh, they have been in the public university all their lives. So you have to actually consider this. The market, cost structure, salary, rental, utilities, marketing, teaching, management, channels, uh, marketing channels, challenges to increase the student number, to manage uh, how to spend prudently, uh, to get quality staff on board, make the utilities uh, visible, collection of fees, and dealing with problematic staff, defining roles of CEO and ED. You know, last year uh, in July, we brought in a person from UM Holding. Uh, his role was to be the ED, the executive uh, director. Uh, there were some issues uh, in the roles between the CEO and the ED. I think they could, this could have been uh, resolved if we had uh, more discussions at the board level. Getting approval for international students, this, is, uh, this has got to do with the EMGS, uh, limited funds. We had borrowed again, we had borrowed from UM twice after the initial 20 million. We, I borrowed uh, 6 million on one occasion and another 3 million the second occasion. And then it lasted until now. Alhamdulillah. So it makes to uh, close to about 30 million, which, which is not bad. Huh? Uh, to make stakeholders understand that it takes time to break even. We ran a study and we found out that in order for you to break even, a private university to break even, it takes between 5 years to 7 years. But some quarters are thinking that we must make money and must show profit the next year, one year after it starts. There are people who are like that, you know. Do you believe that? <laughs> this is not Goreng Pisang. 
uh, okay ways of overcoming problem i think you can think about this because the bell has been has has, has uh, been sounded uh, i have to expedite uh, this is the topic i was talking about we have the dual award as an advertisement some of our students in wales overcoming issues and challenges okay we had online application prudent spending <coughs> everyone must understand that spending is uh, to be prudent uh, we originally appointed staff on contract basis for one to two years okay we recognize that getting the new programs approval is taking a lot of time uh, so we had to plan ahead use advertise advertisement in various mediums uh, Collection of fees is a problem. Uh, we have to take drastic action uh, in this case. Get used to and ad adjusting to the introduction of the NED, Executive Director, getting approval for international students. You see, uh, sometimes people say that uh, you can actually pay agents to expedite uh, your EMGS application. But I never resorted to that kind of uh, thing because I think if we pay an agent money for the agent to get fast approval from EMGS, uh, something's not right. Yeah. <laughs> so I would rather do it alone, rather do it myself. Uh, limited funds, okay, we borrowed twice. Uh, managing stakeholders, okay, this is what I mentioned just now. Uh, these were the programs as of 2014 we had 19 programs uh, three of these programs here uh, were taken off the shelf because it wasn't economical to run uh, this is uh, this scenario uh, this was taken from the budget uh, paper prepared in 2015 so it is estimated by this year by this year here we would be able to make some profit. It started way back in 2013, right? Uh, 2017. Uh, but then still, we will have accumulated loss uh, before tax of this uh, number. Uh, then 2019, <coughs> 2020. So by 2020, we would give UM money. We would have paid back every single thing that they have uh, invested. And then we will give them profit, inshallah. Uh, student number, uh, this number's real number, 2013, 106, 2014, 435, total number, uh, 2015, 874, uh, 2016, 1261. When I left, it was 1320, uh, 2018. This is a magical number, 2600. When we have 2600, we will not have uh, uh, UM. Uh, help anymore because they know that we are going to be able to sustain on our own. Some lessons learned, uh, some of the very important things that we have to take care freshman retention ratio, faculty ratio, graduate professional school options. You know that to our surprise, uh, our PhD students in business especially, uh, we have a lot of PhD students. Uh, for business itself, PhD, we have about 120 students. And I was surprised. When I talked to them, they say that it's because of the strategic location. Uh, they can actually move around uh, in KL. And uh, the fact that they can actually go to Wales. Okay, second time. I think the third time they will come with a punch. <laughs> okay, go very quickly. Summary, okay. Number one, the private university <coughs> based on joint venture is a unique collaboration. It takes time to reach a break-even point between five to five, uh, seven years. Uh, prudent spending is a must. So we cannot afford to be like some uh, public universities uh, who are not very prudent in spending. Uh, programs that are marketable, uh, managed risk of bureaucracy is a must. Uh, 
Uh, this we talk about MQA, EMGS, uh, the local authorities, etc. The use of internet and social media is very effective in marketing. Uh, quality stuff, money, uh, branding, and marketing, quality program del delivery and uh, stakeholder supports are very important. I hope I've given you uh, some uh, piece of information that you can take home and uh, try to think about. And if you are a private uh, university operator, then you can share with your fellow clicks. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Azza, for that very detailed description of uh, the hell he went through. <laughs> I will tell you the truth. I've been a board member of this university from the very beginning. Prof. Azza make it sound very nice, doesn't it? But honestly, I've sat in so many university boards, University of Malaya board, IUMW board, Sunway University board, a few college board. This board is hell. <laughs> But he didn't make it to uh, sound like that, you know. But uh, I will add up to that story later on when I give my part. But let's have three questions for Prof. Hamza. Uh, I join the uh, university. What about the equity? Where do you join with Will as well? Does Will provide some money to you know for your expenditure? Uh, expenditure? Yes. Uh, it was <coughs> agreed that uh, UM would hold uh, the majority of the share. Uh, the figure was about 60-40 uh, <coughs> but whether it actually materialized in full is another story <coughs> next they did they give yes sir just a short one is every student who graduate entitled for the dual degree from Wales does it depend on the CGPA okay uh, for this particular dual award, anybody that gets into the system, we encourage them to go for the dual award. But there are students who will say that they don't want to go for the dual award. It's a matter of choice. Because if they don't want to go for the dual award, of course, their fees will be lower. When does the student decide? At the beginning. At the beginning, and we give them until the end of the first year. Because, because the second year and the third year, uh, results are very important to Wales. So we give them until the end of the first year. After that, they have to actually appeal. But why do you have to wait too long? Yes. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, taking off from what Prof. Sakina said in her address, that she would have preferred to have had a brand new institution uh, rather than deal with an existing one. Yes. My question to you, sir, is um, you had to deal with University of Wales and University of Malaya, which means you had two sets of policies, practices, cultures, subcultures to deal with. Oh, yes. So to what extent um, did this impact on your day-to-day -day execution and policy making, and uh, how do you think you resolved those? Thank you. Okay, um, not only do I have to um, deal with the uh, two universities, UM, University of Wales, uh, we have also to deal with um, the board members uh, from UM. We have to deal with uh, the uh, inspectorates uh, from KPT. Uh, we have to deal with the, uh, because UM actually instructed their auditor to come into IUMW to inspect after we ran for about two years uh, to find out if everything is all right. So the uh, one thing that I have to declare is that if you do things on a transparent basis, transparent, even if there is no governance, you do it very transparent. Uh, you do it on an honest basis, you know, and follow all the good guiding principles, the simple ones, things will be all right. Yeah. Even if, uh, even, even the MQ, uh, MQA, no, not MQA, but the KPT, uh, send auditors twice to IUMW to check if everything is all right. They didn't find anything wrong. But those are the guiding principles. Always be on the safe side. Uh, always take care. 
there will be mistakes here and there but these are mistakes that can be corrected but the major ones we didn't uh, do any yeah um, the policy uh, that's the policy but how it affects the day to day uh, we have to make sure that the students get their best every time so even if these people come into the picture ask questions and start to give problems uh, we must make sure that the students' interests are taken care of every day. Uh, whether the students are postgraduate students, undergraduate students, master students. Uh, I make sure that uh, their responses uh, to their inquiries or their problems are dealt with immediately. If not, you know, I will personally go to the ground and meet up with them. Okay. Any more pressing question? If not, we give a round of applause to Prof. Hamza for a job uh, well done. Thank you, sir.